Hello and a very good morning to all students and welcome to Baidu's Exam Prep IAS. Let us take a look at the various topics we have in line for today's Hindu news analysis. Before that, just a reminder that after the session ends, please do not forget to head on to our Telegram channel for a quiz that has been prepared on this particular session. So what are the topics for the day? In the detailed analysis portion, we have two very important topics, one related to Indo-China relations especially with regards to China giving stapled visa or denying entry to certain athletes of India during the ongoing Asian Games. The second article is regarding the great power contest in West Asia, how the US role is diminishing, how this vacuum is being filled by the other powers and what role can India play and how should India tread the line of non-alignment with any major power in this particular region. In the prelims wide section, now this session is a little prelims heavy. So in the prelims wide section, we have four articles which have been elaborately explained in the prelims section. The first article is a clear message to industry on dispute resolution. This is regarding the Mediation Act that has recently been passed by both the Houses of the Parliament and it has received the assent of President and has been notified in the Indian Gazette on 15th September. The second article is regarding the Quad. The Quad, you know, it is the group of four countries. Now, recently, the Quad ministers, the foreign ministers, the external affairs ministers of the Quad group, they held a meeting at the fringe of the UN General Assembly meeting. So, what all decisions were taking, taken over there? What is Quad? We'll take a look in this particular article. The third one is regarding the revising of, the, of certain rules related to construction, around the sites that have been protected by the archaeological survey of India. So what are, what is the call regarding this revision? What all needs to be re revised? What is the act that is governing the monuments of India? That will be covered in this article. The last article is regarding the MotoGP, the first MotoGP India edition that is being held in Noida, that is the Gautam Buddhanagar of Uttar Pradesh in the Buddha circuit, the Buddha international circuit. So here are certain facts regarding the MotoGP, when it started, what all are the various rounds of it, what all flags are used to depict various actions during the MotoGP. So you know that in prelims, these sport related questions can also come. So that is why this particular topic becomes very important. Now let us start with our first topic. The Sports Minister of India, Mr. Anurag Thakur, he will be skipping the inaugural ceremony of the Asia, that is the Asian Games. Now, what is the reason? Three Wushu players of India, they were denied entry to China. Out of these three players, one of them was not even allowed to board the flight from Delhi. The other two were not allowed to go beyond Hong Kong. Okay, so this is the biggest reason why this decision has been taken. Now, India has already registered a protest against this act of China and our sports minister will be skipping the inauguration altogether. Now, what is the reason for this denial of entry? See, there is an Asian game protocol that the athletes, they are not given visas. They are given accreditation cards and these accreditation cards, they act as what? They act as the visa to allow the entry of these athletes into the country which is hosting the Asian Games. Now what happened is that according to officials from China, the accreditation cards, they were provided to these three Wushu players from the state of Arunachal Pradesh. because of a mistake, because of an oversight. Because what is the reason? China considers Arunachal Pradesh as its own territory. So according to that, if it belongs to China, the athletes, they would not require any kind of accreditation cards or any kind of visas to enter China. However, they were provided to these three players from Arunachal Pradesh. So, because this was done, 
officials said that they were given instructions to not allow these three players to board a flight from India. Okay. Now, what is India's stance? India has, since the time that stapled visa started being given by China to Indian citizens, since then India has firmly rejected any kind of differential treatment to the Indian citizens on the basis of where they are from. What is their domicile or what is their ethnicity? Which state are they coming from? Now, over this development, China has also responded. China has stated that it has never recognized the so-called Arunachal Pradesh region of India. That region, it completely belongs to China and recently, last month only, China had released its revised map which had included the Arunachal Pradesh, the entire Arunachal Pradesh region of India within Chinese territory apart from certain regions from the Union territories of Leh and Ladakh as well as Jammu and Kashmir. India had protested that move. Later, when India was holding G20, China as well as Pakistan, they had protested India having any kind of G20 meetings in Arunachal Pradesh, Leh and Ladakh as well as Jammu and Kashmir because according to them, these are disputed territories but in, for India, these are our territories. They do not belong to anyone else. China has it had issued these accreditation cards to these athletes but the latter, they did not accept them according to China's words. That they had issued visas to these athletes but they did not accept them. Why? Because they were stapled. Now the organizing committee of the Asia Games, that is the Olympic Council of Asia, under whose ages these Asiads they are being held, they have said that they are trying to find a solution to this problem. However, no solution it has been given as of now. Now, what is this stapled visa? This entire controversy regarding stapled visa. Now, generally, when you go to any other country, so your passport, it has a visa sticker stuck on it and stamped. However, what China does is that, it provides these detachable or stapled visas. So these visas, these stickers on your passport, these stickers, they are either stapled or pinned. They are not stuck and stamped. So this is what is stapled visa. Now these visas, they are considered legal by China. However, they are completely rejected by India. Since the year 2009, China has been issuing these stapled visas to Indians that belong to Arunachal Pradesh and certain regions of Leh and Ladakh as well as Jammu and Kashmir. So this story is not a recent one. That This has been continuing since the year 2009. And because of that, in the past, many athletes from these regions, especially from Arunachal Pradesh region, they have not been able to take part in certain athletic events that are taking place in China, of which China is the host. The most recent one was the World University Games that were held in July 2023. Now, here also certain athletes from Arunachal Pradesh, they were provided stapled visa. As a protest, India altogether refused to send any athlete for any sport to this particular event. Okay, so this was a very strong protest, a very strong move by India against this particular policy of China. Now, why does China do this? According to China, it does not recognize Arunachal Pradesh because according to them, this is Arunachal Pradesh is actually their territory known as Zangan or South Tibet. So that is why they have refused to provide any kind of proper visas to the citizens from this region and instead they provide these detachable or stapled visa since the year 2009. 
So this is the stapled visa controversy with China, which we have been continuously opposing since the time it started. The biggest opposition, you can state in your answer, was when during the World University Games, India refused to send even a single person from its contingent to China in, because certain of its athletes, they were provided stapled visas. Now, a little bit about these Asian Games. Now, Asian Games, they are also known as the Asiads. And they are inspired by the Olympic Games that take place at a global scale. Now, Asiads, they were established by a society or a federation known as Asian Games Federation. Now, it is known as the Olympic Council of India. Now, the Olympic Council of India or then Asian Games Federation, they decided in the year 1949 that we need to start certain games at a continent level and for that the Asian Games they were started. The first one, the first Asian game was held in the year 1951. Now, this is important for us. Why? Because the first Asian Games, they were held in India in the year 1951. Since then, they are held once every four years, just like Olympics. However, due to certain reasons, if in a particular year, the Games, they are not being held, they can be postponed to the next year. As was done this time, Ideally, the games would have been in 2022, but because of the COVID pandemic, they were pushed to 2023. Now, New Delhi, apart from hosting the 1951 Asian Games, they also hosted the games in the year 1982. Overall, there are 45 participating nations who are all affiliated to the OCA, that is the Olympic Council of Asia. There are three Asian countries which are entirely in Asia, that is Cyprus, Armenia and Israel, which do not participate in the Asian Games, but they participate instead in the European Games. Now, there is a curious case regarding Israel. Up until the year 1976, it was a part of the Asian Games. However, in 1976, it was expelled out of this entire contingent. Because of certain security reasons arising out of the 1972 Munich incident. Okay. So, till 1982, Israel kept requesting a re entry into the Asian Games, but it was not allowed. Taiwan which again China considers as, as its own territory, it also participates under the Asian Games, but under the flag of Chinese Taipei. Now, up until now, this current one is the 19th edition of Asian Games. So up until now, 19 editions of Asian Games, they have been held, including the current one. Only seven nations, seven countries, they have participated in all these editions. What are these seven countries? First, India. Then we have Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Singapore and Thailand. So, India has been a part of all the Asian Games since its commencement. The previous version, the 18th version of the Asian Games, it was held in the country of Indonesia. So, this is about the Asian Games and the Chinese stapled visa controversy. Now, we come to the next topic which is regarding the power context, contest that is going on in West Asia especially as the U.S. influence in the area has been declining because U.S. is now prioritizing certain other regions of the world. Now first, let us take a look at these maps. What is West Asia? What all countries are included there? What all major water bodies are surrounding this region? So this is West Asia. Sometimes Iran is also considered as a part of it. So, we have countries like Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, 
Cyprus, the small country Cyprus, we have Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman. Now Oman is this as well as this small part. We have Qatar, Bahrain and UAE which are entirely a part of West Asia. Now what are the major bodies, water bodies surrounding this region? Here we have, you can see here we have the Caspian Sea. Then here we have the Black Sea. In this region we have the Mediterranean. Here we have the Red Sea. Here is Egypt. The Suez Canal region. Then this is Babel Mandap. The Strait of Bab el Mandap, which is very essential for the entire Suez Canal route from coming from Mediterranean to the Arabian Sea. Now, this is Gulf of Aden. Here is Arabian Sea. Now, this particular region, this small region, it is what? Strait of Hormuz. Now what is a strait? Strait is a very small or narrow water body that is connecting two bigger water bodies. A land version of that is Isthmus. Example Isthmus of Panama. Isthmus is a narrow strip of land that is connecting two bigger land masses. Okay, So that is the difference between a strait and an Isthmus. So here is Strait of Hormuz. This is Persian Gulf. And this is Gulf of Oman. Because Oman is the country that is surrounding it apart from other countries. Okay, So this is the entire geography of the region. The political as well as the physical. Now currently what is the policy of the United States in West Asia? So they have a two-fold policy. First is bringing the Gulf Arab and Israel together in order to counter Iran. Now you know that in West Asia there are three major powers. One is Saudi Arabia, second is Israel, third is Iran. Now these independently are very good allies of USA and this is considered as an enemy of USA. They are separately allies, but their relations with each other, they are not that cordial. USA is, however, trying to improve the relations between Saudi Arabia as well as Israel in order to bring in stability in the entire region. Second policy of USA is that it wants to assure its friends across the world and its allies in this region that it will not be exiting the region anytime soon. Because USA provides a lot of security both in terms of infrastructure as well as in terms of troops to the region. So there is a fear amongst the various allies the various countries that if USA completely exits this region just like it did in Afghanistan there will be a lot of chaos and havoc that will be created in this region. So these are the twofold policies current policies of the Biden administration in the West Asian region of the world. Now historically USA has been a pivot has been the central point around which West Asian countries, they have developed their bilateral relationship. So USA has always acted like a broker, like an agent to help improve the relations between the various countries. Also, as the relations of USA with any other, any nation in the Western Asia, it improved or declined accordingly the relations of the other countries the allies of USA they used to change with that particular nation so historically that has been the case however now what has happened is that USA it has started reducing its focus on West Asia and increasing its focus in East Asia part and also in Eastern Europe region 
Why in Eastern Europe? Because of Russia. Especially because of the Ukraine-Russia war. And Russia's stance with regards to certain East European countries. Why in East Asia? Because of China. So that is why USA, it has its attention has now been diverted to two other places instead of West Asia. So this has led to two another very interesting developments. The first one is that the West Asian countries, they are now becoming more and more autonomous with regards to their foreign policies and with regards to the bilateral relationships that exist within the West Asian countries. Very good examples of this include how there has been an agreement between Saudi and UAE on one side as well as Iran on the other side. And this was brokered by who? By China. Second, the relations with Qatar. Now the Gulf Cooperation Council, it had expelled Qatar because according to Saudi Arabia, which has the highest amount of influence in GCC, according to Saudi Arabia, Qatar was involved in certain terrorist activities. This happened in 2017. There was a complete breakdown of relations between Qatar and the GCC countries. However, there was an improvement seen without any in influence of USA or any other nation. There was an improvement in the relationship and by the year 2021, Qatar was once again included in the organization. Okay, so these are two very good examples. The third very important example is how the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has stated that the relations between Saudi and Israel, they have been now improving. Again, USA does not have any hand in this. These relations, they have been improving by the actions of these two countries. And the fourth one, which can be a very big pain point for USA is that UAE, Saudi and Iran, they are set to become members of BRICS in January 2024. So this is one of the biggest pain point for USA. Also another development because of this, because of this reduced influence of USA is that there was a power vacuum that has now been created in the region and countries they have been trying to fill this vacuum. Now usually all over the world if there is a power vacuum these days who is filling that power vacuum? It's China, right? So here also China is trying to fill this power vacuum. Now China it has a huge dependence on West Asian countries almost 70% dependence on these nations for its imports of oil and gas. So China has been trying to improve its relations with these nations. It has now become the biggest trading partner of the Gulf nations. It has been increasing its investment in the region, trying to bring these countries into the Belt and Road Initiative of China. So China has been doing that. The biggest example of Chinese influence was this. How two mortal enemies, they were able to establish peace. They were able to come to an agreement with each other. Saudi Arabia and Iran as well as UAE. This entire deal was brokered by China. So China is now trying to act as a peacekeeper in the region as well. Now, USA has been trying to increase to make India enter this region as in order to ful fulfill this vacuum. They do not want Chinese influence to increase in the region and that is why they are trying to push India to enter this region. See, India has had historic relations with the region. We have very good economic relations. We already import a lot of oil and gas. We have a lot of immigrants from India that are staying in this region. They are providing us with a lot of remittance. So we do have good relations over here as of now. However, one problem 
one flash point is the OIC the organization of Islamic countries which has been continuously calling out India on the instigation of Pakistan with regards to Jammu and Kashmir region okay however America USA wants India to increase its role in the region so as a part of that what have they done during the G20 meeting India became a part of the Middle East corridor the India Middle East European corridor which is very much funded by who by USA and European Union so this will improve the connectivity between India as well as the Middle East and will help in improving our relations also since 2012 India has been a part of this mini lateral effort that is I2U2 I2U2 includes whom India Israel UAE and USA now this initiative again was under the leadership of USA because USA wants the West Asia and South Asian region to have better economic and strategic relations with each other so this particular organization this particular mini lateral organization will be focusing upon improving economic cooperation on the face of it and as an underlying fact improving the strategic cooperation between the member states now this is one thing this is what India is is a part of what US led initiatives however here India is also a part of certain initiatives of which countries like Russia and China which USA is not close to is not favorable of they are a part of for example the international north south corridor which will connect India with Russia via Central Asia we our connectivity to West Asia might also increase because of this international corridor we are also the founding member of BRICS BRICS includes Russia and China who again were the founding members of the organization right so we are also a part of this so we are very carefully treading this sharp edge so that we do not end up causing any kind of problems to ourselves we do not end up looking like we are favoring one of the groups more than the other groups now why is this essential why is multi engagement essential because this will help us avoiding any kind of diplomatic mistakes in the West Asian region that we had already done where in Afghanistan so in Afghanistan we were not there we were not there physically but we were supporting the efforts of US and its allies against Taliban right however now Taliban government has come in Afghanistan and India does not have any diplomatic relations with that also recently just last week China established proper diplomatic relations with Taliban with Afghanistan which is very important economically why because it can be a house of rare earth metals which will be very important for these new emerging clean technologies now India has lost out against China with regards to Afghanistan and we do not want to make the same mistakes in Middle East and that is why we are carefully being a part we are diplomatically being a part of both these alliances so this is about this particular article now we move to the prelims white section in the prelims white section the first article is regarding the mediation act of 2023 which has been passed by the parliaments in the monsoon session and it got the presidential assent in September and it has now been notified in the Gazette of India now what are the key features of this mediation act now mediation as you all know is a means of alternate dispute resolution so that without going the going to the courts 
the parties they can come together and they can come to a solution now there are various means by which adr can be held in the next slide we will be taking a look at that but before that what are the key features of this mediation act now according to the act every mediation agreement that takes place between the various parties it needs to be in a written format it need not it should not be verbal in order to avoid any kind of future lawsuits parties the various parties that are involved in the conflict they can either voluntarily or mutually decide to opt for mediation before going to the courts now earlier draft of this bill which was sent to the standing committee that draft it had called for two mandatory mediation sessions before the parties they went to the court now this has been scrapped and this entire exercise has been made voluntarily next there are certain exemptions certain exceptions in which cases mediation cannot take place what are these criminal proceedings by one party against another party proceedings that are initiated in relation to misconduct of any registered professional registered professional like a ca like a company secretary like an auditor and so on and the third exemption the third except exception is any disputes which are related to levy or collection of any kind of taxes or refunds they also need not go to mediation they all these they will directly go to the courts mediation will not be an option for these type of cases now what about a mediator mediator is a neutral party which helps in improving the communication between the conflicting parties now mediator according to this act they can be of any nationality they need not be indian and they can be appointed as a mediator they can be appointed either directly by the parties when the parties they discuss with each other they come to a understanding that they'll be appointing a particular person as a mediator they can appoint the person they can decide the way in the, which the person needs to be appointed however if these parties are not able to come on a common ground with regards to who will be the mediator they can ask the mediation service provider to appoint the mediator now mediation service provider will have a roster of various mediators that are registered with it and they can choose one of these mediators to mediate this entire process now this particular thing this appointment of the mediator by the mediation service provider it needs to be done within 7 days after the parties they request msp to appoint the mediator also mediation should be held within the jurisdiction of the court or the tribunal that is competent competent to adjudicate on the dispute for example if delhi high court it has the jurisdiction where the dispute has occurred so if there is any case that case it will be sent to delhi high court for any further proceedings however if the parties they want to undertake mediation they need to ensure that that mediation also takes place within the region where the jurisdiction of delhi high court it exists however if any party is unable to come to that location these proceedings they can be done in an online format or at any third location like say in chennai however when the mediation takes place this entire mediation it will be under the jurisdiction of delhi high court and not the madras high court because it needs to be mentioned that this mediation is under the jurisdiction of this particular court also this act it defines a timeline it defines that any kind of this mediation it should 
take place and it, it should get completed within 120 days after the first appearance of the parties before the mediator. This can be extended by 60 days. If still the mediation is not done, then these parties, they can go to the courts. Also, once approved, the settlement agreement, it needs to be signed by all the involved parties and it needs to be adjudicated by the mediator. So, this is, these are the key features of the Mediation Act of 2023. Now, what are the various types of alternate dispute resolutions? First, we have arbitration. Now, arbitration, the final result of the arbitration, the final document, it is binding on the parties. Now, under this, there is an appointment of an impartial third party, which is known as the arbitrator, who hears both sides of the dispute and makes a binding decision. Now, this appointment of the third party, it is done by the agreement of both the or all the parties that are involved in the conflict. So, this is arbitration. Please note that the decision is binding in case of arbitration. In case of conciliation and mediation, both the decision is non-binding. The final decision is non-binding. So, what is the difference between conciliation and mediation? It is regarding the role of the conciliator and the mediator. The conciliator has a more authoritative role compared to the mediator. Mediator is just like an observing party, whereas conciliator, it can add its argument when the various parties, they are discussing the matter. So, in conciliation, a neutral third party, it assists the disputing parties in reaching an agreement. It helps in improving the communication and negotiation between the various warring or conflicting parties. But the final document, it is not binding on the parties. Then mediation. Mediator also helps the parties in communicating and reaching a commonly acceptable solution for the problem. Again, not binding. Then we have judicial settlements. For example, you know about uh, organizations like Lok Adalats in India. So Lok Adalat is also a form of what? Alternate dispute resolution. So in case of judicial settlements also, there is a third party that is helping in resolving the issues between the conflicting parties. However, the third party is actually a judge. Okay, So they are a judge. Judge is helping both the parties come to an agreement. The judge is not giving any kind of final judgment on the issue. They are just helping the parties negotiate and come to a proper solution. Now, negotiation. Negotiation is one of the most common and basic form of ADR. You do negotiations in your day-to-day -day life as well. For example, negotiation regarding your location when you get a job, your salary when you get a job, some things like that. Now, in negotiation, parties that are involved in the dispute or that are involved in a matter that they are not agreed to, they try to resolve it directly without involvement of a third party through various discussions. So these are the various types of ADRs. They are important for India. Their development is very important for India. Why? Because there has been an increase in pendency, in case pendency across all the tiers of judiciary across the country. The next article is regarding the meeting of the foreign ministers or the external affairs ministers of the quad grouping at the fringe of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Now because it was at the fringe of United Nations General Assembly, definitely there was discussion of how the UN Charter it can be reformed. There needs to be an increase in both the permanent and temporary membership 
of the United Nations Security Council. So all the Quad countries, they came to this very important conclusion. What were the other major takeaways from this meeting? The Indo-Pacific region, the Quad grouping, it came into being because of this region. It wants a free and open Indo-Pacific region where any kind of disputes, they are resolved mutually within the international law. Why? To counter China, to counter Chinese stance of claiming large portions of other countries as its, as its own. So, this is another major takeaway. We ensured that we are still committed to this issue. Also, the countries they discussed, the Quad countries they discussed regarding setting up a new initiative with the leadership of these four nations and other countries can also be a part of it to respond to any kind of terror attacks. With regards to Ukraine, the stance of the Quad countries was same as the stance of G20. We want the war to end, but we did not mention Russia as the aggressor. We also, the Quad countries also bagged the efforts by the United Nations to restart the Black Sea Grain Initiative which was ended abruptly in July 2023. Even during the G20, the United Nations, European Union, Turkey and various other nations, they discussed intensely regarding restarting of this initiative in order to reduce the grain prices all across the world. So we have also, the Quad grouping has also backed this initiative. With regards to North Korea, what have we done? We have condemned the act of North Korea, the act of Pyongyang regarding launch of certain missiles and their pursuit of nuclear weapon. According to Quad grouping, it can lead to destabilization stabilization of the region of the East Asian region. Now Japan which is a part of Quad it is a maritime neighbor of North Korea and many a times the launches of these missiles and the nuclear weapons they can easily impact Japan as a country. With regards to Myanmar the Quad grouping they supported a transition to a democracy, a federal democracy from a military junta rule. They have also supported the ASEAN five-point consensus document that was signed between ASEAN countries as well as the military junta of Myanmar. What were these five points that were discussed that are included in this consensus? First is secession or stopping any kind of violence. Second, facilitation of dialogue between the military, between the other civil society organizations and other leaders within Myanmar. Third is, there will be appointment, there needs to be an appointment of a special envoy to mediate this entire, entire issue, entire situation. Also, there will be a visit by the special envoy to Myanmar to discuss the situation and to understand the ground reality. Fifth, the Asian countries, they have asked the military junta of Myanmar to allow them to help Myanmar with regards to human, humanitarian aid. And the Quad countries, they have perfectly supported this, per, this consensus document between ASEAN and Myanmar Janta. However, please note that Myanmar is also a part of ASEAN. Now a little bit about the Quad grouping. It is also known as Quadrilateral Security Grouping, which is shortened to Quad. It has India, Japan, USA, and Australia. So it is a quadrilateral. What is a quadrilateral? A polygon with four vertices, four edges, two diagonals. 
right so quad grouping it is this four powers they have come together to improve the security of the region that they belong to mainly what indo pacific region now this grouping it emerged as an informal group back in the year 2004 after the tsunami after the 2004 tsunami however the idea of converting this into a security grouping was first proposed in 2007 by shinzo abe however australia did not join this grouping why because they were afraid that china might be might not take it positively however later on in 2017 the quad grouping it finally formally came into being the first formal summit of the grouping was in the year 2021 in washington dc later in 2022 a virtual summit was organized now many countries of the region of this region they are now interested in joining the quad the biggest one is south korea south korea is very much interested in joining so the quad group it organizes a quad plus meeting which includes the officials from south korea new zealand and vietnam okay now there the malabar exercise which earlier used to take place only between india and usa now it takes place between all the quad members in 2015 japan entered malabar exercises and in 2020 australia became a part of it okay so this again becomes a very important way in which we are coordinating with each other in order to improve the security of the indo pacific region the next topic is regarding the asi protected monuments now there is a standing committee of parliament known as parliamentary standing committee on transport tourism and culture now this committee it wants a revision of certain aspects of the of the monument rules of india so what is it it wants the revision of the rule that provides for a 100 meter prohibited and 300 meter regulated area around all the monuments that are protected by the archaeological survey of india now this in this prohibited area any kind of activities like mining like construction they are completely prohibited no one can take place no one can involve themselves in these kind of activities in this region in the regulated region if anyone wants to undertake any kind of construction they will have to get a permission from the archaeologics archaeological survey of india which is a very lengthy process now this rule was included under the 2010 amendment of the act ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act which was first enacted in 1958 now why is this parliamentary standing committee standing panel asking for these changes now there are certain villages that are located in the vicinity of these monuments now in these villages the people they are very angry they are resent there is resentment against these monuments why because these people they are not able to undertake construction and repair work even within their houses they would require either the permission of the asi if they exist in the regulated zone or they are completely prohibited from doing this if they are living in the prohibited zone so that is one issue that is reducing the community engagement in protection of these monuments also same rules of this pro prohibited and regulated area they apply to major monuments like say ajanta and alora or any minor monuments like certain small tombs or certain small very unimportant forts okay so same rules are applying everywhere so people they are highly confused apart from this the panel it also recommended that we need to overhaul the list of monuments of national importance the asi protected monuments they need to be rationalized 
because currently we have 3691 such monuments the list needs to be rationalized and it needs to be categorized into the monuments that are of national significance unique architectural value and specific heritage content the other monuments that are less important they can be provided a lesser amount of security now about this act that we were talking about the act was first introduced in the year 1957 in order to protect and preserve the ancient monuments of the country the various archaeological sites remains of national importance so that the future generations can also enjoy and learn from them the archaeological survey of india it works under this act now please note that archaeological survey of india was not established under this act it was established by the british indian government back in the year 1861 however now it works under the ages of this act now act also establishes certain advisory bodies to advise regarding how this protection can be improved like the national monuments authority now first time this act was amended in the year 2010 to include certain definitions like definition of antiquities redefining definition of archaeological officer you do not need to go into further details just know that first amendment was in 2010 the major thing with regards to this amendment was that it increased the power with the central government to make any kind of rules regarding the archaeological sites and heritage monuments of the country earlier the state governments they had higher power compared to center but now the center it acquired larger amount of power compared to the states in 2017 there was again another amendment that allowed the government to take up infrastructure projects within the prohibited area so government could undertake these projects in order to say increase the access to these sites to improve tourism and other things however the private entities the residents they could not still take a part in this so right now the government has already stated to the par parliamentary panel that they are in the process of bringing another amendment to this act in order to resolve these kind of grievances that the people have with regards to the ancient monuments the last article of the day is regarding the moto gp now the inaugural moto gp grand prix of india it is taking place from friday to sunday it started yesterday it will go on till tomorrow at the buddha international circuit which is located in the Gautam Buddha Nagar of Uttar Pradesh, also known as what? Noida. Now this term, a brief history about MotoGP. This term MotoGP, it is a very recent term, coined in the year 20, 2002. However, this competition, this bike racing competition is an old one. This championship, it is being held since the year 1949. That was one year before the F1 started, the Formula 1 started. Formula 1 is what? Car racing. It started in 1950. Now the Federation International, the Motorcyclism, that is FIM, the International Federation of Motorcycles. It is the governing body of this racing of these two-wheeler bikes. The current commercial rights holder of MotoGP is Dorna Sports. Now please note that the bikes you see over here, the bikes that are used in MotoGP, it is illegal to run those bikes on roads. Okay, So they are specifically designed only for racing. They cannot be used on the general roads. In, the car, in this MotoGP Grand Prix of India, there are 11 teams that are taking part. Five are factory teams and six are satellite teams. What are factory teams? Now there are various companies like Yamaha, like KTM, which, which make bikes. Okay, They make very good bikes. They also make the bikes that can be used for racing purposes. So these companies, they develop their own teams 
where the team members they are provided with the bikes of these companies then there are certain independent people who can also independent people or firms who can also have their own teams known as satellite teams now these satellite teams they can purchase the vehicles purchase these motorcycles from the various manufacturers including these five factory team manufacturers and they can have their own candidates that will be contesting in in their name so there are 11 teams five factory teams what are the factories that are involved here we have yamaha honda ducati ktm and aprilia now each team it fields two riders okay so there are in total 22 riders now the first day there is a practice session the top 10 teams of the practice session they go to qualifier two directly the next day we have qualifier stages the qualifier stage one it has the rest of the teams of the practice sessions Sorry, not the teams, the riders. The rest of the riders of the practice sessions, that means 12 riders, right? Out of these, whatever are top two, they enter Q2. So Q2 has who all? The top 10 riders of the practice session and top two riders of Q1. Now they all race in Q2 and finally, what is decided because of all this? Why are they racing beforehand? To decide where which rider will stand. The rider which gets this position that is known as the pole position gets a best advantage. Because there is no clutter of vehicles in front of them. They get an added advantage to speed up and just keep on going. The back riders they have many other riders in front of them so their chances of winning they might reduce so whoever wins in these q2 they are allowed to choose where they want to stand during the race okay so that is why the practice and the qualifier session is held so that during the final session it can be decided who will stand where now buddha circuit earlier it had hosted f1 in the year 2013 later it also hosted the asian road racing championship of 2016 to make the tracks safer for bikes what all improvements have been done to the buddha circuit there is a need to increase the gravel content on the road why because this gravel content helps in improving the grip of the bike tires with the road it avoids any kind of skidding or slipping of the bikes which can lead to injury of the various participants there is also installation of various various safety features in the high impact zones like these corners the track corners and other places so all these changes they have been done to the buddha circuit now we come to the flags of the MotoGP. Now please note that once it was announced that F1 is going to be organized in 2013, UPSC in 2012 mains. They asked a question regarding the various flags that are used in Formula 1 races. So this again becomes very important for us. So what are the various flags of MotoGP? First is the green flag. That means the track is free and the race can be started second is the yellow flag which indicates that there is some danger on the track usually when any accident it occurs on the track then the yellow flag is shown if this flag is shown then any kind of overtaking is forbidden for all the participants now there is another yellow flag with red stripes red vertical stripes now when this yellow flag with red stripes and a white flag with red cross they are shown together then this warns the competitors that the grip of the truck it has reduced so there are more chances that the contestants that the participants they might skid or slip 
Now this reduction of the track grip can be due to water, oil, clay, gravel or any other reason. Then we have the white flag. When this flag is flown, it means that it is raining and the various participants, they can enter their pit boxes. The various pit boxes, they are present where the bikers can go and get any kind of assistance that they need. So they may enter these pit boxes in order to change their bike for the one that is adapted to these rainy conditions. Then we have a blue flag which is shown to a slower rider. If for example this is one rider, this is second. This one is slow, this one is very fast. So this blue flag is shown to the slower rider who is close to being overtaken by the faster rider. The, for the slower rider, they must then allow for this overtaking to take place. A red flag means immediate stopping of the race or any kind of qualifier or a practice session. When this flag appears, all the riders, they need to slow down immediately and go back to their pits. Okay, So this ends, this stops any kind of racing on the tracks. Then there is a check flag, a white and black, black check flag that shows the end of the race. Same thing for F1 as well. We have this check flag that when flown, it shows that the race has now ended. Then a black flag, a black flag along with the number of the rider, the bike of the rider, it means that the rider whose number is being shown they must leave the track and go to the pits immediately. Then there is another flag, a black flag with an orange circle. Japan's flag is what? White with red circle. Similar to that, this is black with orange circle. Along with that, when the rider number is shown, that means they are trying to inform the rider that there is certain technical problems, certain mechanical problems with their bike. So they need to leave the track immediately and go to their pit in order to change their bikes. So these are the various flags of the MotoGP. And with that, we come to an end to this session. Now here are two main practice questions. First is, China has been using stapled visa to make a statement against India. Comment. Here you can mention what is exactly stapled visa since when China started this policy and what all are the consequences, why are they doing it and how India is countering this particular move. The second question is, the shift of USA towards Chinese monopoly in the Pacific region has benefited China's stance in West Asia. Do you agree? So they are asking for your opinion. You need to tell them whether you agree, whether you disagree and you need to give various arguments in favor or against. Also analyze how India can be a key player in countering Chinese ambitions in West Asia. India is being supported by both the parties. We are being supported by USA. We also are a part of BRICS. We are part of the International North-South Corridor. So our involvement over here is improving. Also. Unlike China, we have what? We have a soft power component because many Indians, they are living in this region. So you can mention all that in this answer. This is 15 marker, 250 words. So do not forget to attempt these questions and also do not forget to go to our Telegram channel to attempt a quiz created on this particular session. The link for the Telegram channel is available in the video description. So I hope you were able to understand all the concepts that we discussed today. So thank you very much and have a very good day ahead.